uh, promises and pitfalls. Um, Jeremy is the Kemper and Ethel Marley Professor and Chair of Neurology and Senior Vice President of the Barrow Neurological Institute. Um, he will then be followed by Dr. James Berry um, on the same theme. Uh, James is Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and Director of the MGH Multidisciplinary ALS Clinic and Chief of the Division of ALS and Motor Neuron Diseases. And with that, I will hand it off to uh, Dr. Scheffner. Thank you, Fernando. Let me just share my screen. So I um, just tried to share my screen and it says it's disabled by the host. Jen, can you help? You should be all set now, Jeremy. I'm help all set now, me. you're right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's, it's great to be here again. I'm, I'm sorry, just like I'm sure everybody else is, that we're not meeting in person. Um, the familiar refrain, refrain of hopefully next year we'll, we'll do this uh, actually in a, in a less uh, virtual fashion. Um, so I'm going to start things off just talking about uh, primarily functional biomarkers, although I'll, I'll touch a little bit on a fluid bio biomarker and focus on things that we've started to do more at home than in the clinic. Uh, here are my disclosures. And this is a sort of a slide to set the bidding a bit uh, and, to, and just talk about where we still are in terms of what we measure in ALS clinical trials, uh, virtually always in phase three and most of the time in phase two as well. Um, we have three uh, different ways of measuring disease progression, one with a functional rating scale, the ALS functional rating scale now revised, um, which is a, a 12 question uh, 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 functional scale divided uh, into four domains, uh, bulbar function, uh, fine motor function, gross motor, and respiratory function. Um, this uh, uh, scale was developed initially in the early 1990s and was revised a few years later to put a greater emphasis on, on pulmonary function. And we've used it so much that we know a lot about it. Um, the pie chart to the right uh, just reflects how the four domains change over time. And, and you can see that one of the aspects of the ALS function rating scale is that it doesn't equally survey all of these four important functions, but in, in fact, fine motor function really drives the decline in the LSFRS much more than anything else. And in particular, much more than pulmonary function, which although uh, it, it represents 25% of the questions and is an incredibly important predictor of, of ALS mortality and quality of life, only reflects 13% of the decline over time. So it, it, it has some, some, some quirks to it. Um, increasingly, attention is being paid to how linear the decline is over the time that patients spend in a, in a clinical trial, although for most trials, the, the linearity is pretty good. Um, secondly, we do measure pulmonary function separately, uh, usually vital capacity, um, and this has been done many, many times in ALS trials, so we know the behavior of ALS patients with this measure as well. And when vital capacity is, predict, is presented as percent predicted uh, as compared to a normal subject of, of this same uh, age and sex, um, the decline in ALS patients is about by 3% predicted uh, uh, points per month. Um, and, the slide, and the panel to the right just shows data from PROACT, well, um, which is a combination of many different clinical trials, uh, uh, placebo groups, showing that, that uh, the, the decline is fairly linear and that uh, although there's scatter around that, li that, that line, uh, one can predict what's going to happen pretty well. And then finally, we look at uh, quantitative strength. Uh, strength is, a, is, is, a, is an attribute that is very predictive of function ALS. And we've been most often using a handheld dynamometer. And with, with good training of the evaluators, uh, we can measure 
up to 20 or so muscles in, in a given session. And the slide to the right is from, the, uh, from a, a, a trial from almost 10 years ago now, showing that the decline is fairly linear and that uh, error bars can be uh, fairly narrow with this measure with good training. Now, these are all valid ways of measuring ALS function, but they all have significant variability around them, both measurement variability and variability of decline. And so all of them require still fairly large trials uh, for, for at least six months to really have a good shot at seeing an effect of a therapy. And so uh, there has been pressure for many years to try to uh, find new biomarkers that can more accurately and sensitively uh, evaluate disease progression. And this is just a, a very brief list of the things that we've looked at. Um, we <clears throat> have a number of physiological uh, uh, probes. The most uh, recently employed one is a measure of axon excitability, which was developed uh, primarily by Matthew Kernan and Steve Uchik in, in Australia. Uh, and, and we've shown that, that both um, measures of excitability of, of motor axons are abnormal in ALS and can be sensitive to disease modification. Um, there is increasing interest in looking at uh, MRI, primarily in, in central nervous uh, system structures, but also in the periphery to evaluate uh, changes in, 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 uh, in motor pathways. Um, and electrical impedance myography is a measure that I'll talk about a bit that actually looks structurally at peripheral structures in, in particular muscle that can be a very sensitive uh, measure of change. Um, there is a, a, are a couple of new functional scales. The road scale is a, is a scale that was built more on uh, paying attention to metric, pro uh, metric properties of, of a scale to, to provide a scale that really uh, where individual questions are, are designed to be uh, approximately equally valued in terms of both importance and, and their range of, of, of change over time. There are, are now a number of different ways of evaluating speech, which everyone would realize is an important attribute that can be uh, very closely tied to function and quality of life. And I'll talk about that a bit as well. And all of these, um, can be measured, or at least many of these can be measured at home. And there are a variety of reasons why that may be a really positive uh, uh, aspect in, in today's world. And, and just to, to revisit some of these, uh, as we measure more aspects of function and, and physiological change in, in ALS trials, there's a danger that the burden of each clinical trial visit can be excessive. Um, not only is it burdensome for patients to get into their car and, and, and get, get transported to, to the clinic, but the actual visits themselves can be many hours in length and can be quite exhausting. And so a home uh, measurement of, of, of outcomes can be a real, a real advantage in reducing that, that uh, visit burden. Uh, we're now again thinking about the dangers of, of congregating. And so um, home, birth burden, home visits can reduce the, the risk of clinical trial participation in that it can reduce the number of times uh, uh, participants have to actually physically engage in, in being at the clinic. And importantly, if a, if a measure can be uh, uh, assessed easily at home, it can be assessed frequently at home. And there, there are data to suggest that the more often you can, can, can measure a given attribute, the more sensitive the change will, can be assessed and the potentially easier it is to see an effect of, of, of therapeutics. And then it, it actually, over the last year, it's been apparent that um, it, it's a nice thing to be able to communicate to patients at home, not just by, by telephone, but to, by, by actual assessment. And, and patients feel like communications are better. Participants in trial feel like they're more connected to the trial. So there are lots of advantages in that regard as well. And I, I'm going to just touch on a few measurements at home that have already been looked at uh, preliminarily. 
there, but there are a whole range of ways that we can think about home measurements. And um, one important uh, uh, way of thinking about things is thinking about measurements that occur passively, just in assessment of activities of daily living, and measurements that occur in a specific encounter, usually involving a specific task and potentially a specific instrument, uh, where um, the patient is, is in contact with uh, a, a, a member of the, of the clinic staff and a, an assessment is, 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 is obtained in a fairly similar way to the way they're done in the clinic over a, a telemedicine hookup. The passive measurements, I think, are, are, are less well-developed. They often involve activity measurements uh, that, that are measured on a, on a watch or, uh, or, or now on a ring. Um, they can also uh, measure how participants uh, impact uh, uh, life with a computer so that a computer cursor can be used as an instrument of how coordination actually is affected. And then we'll talk about some active measurements uh, in the next few slides. And so here's, here's one. Uh, this is one I've talked about before, so I won't spend too much time on it. On it. Uh, electrical impedance myography is a structural measure of muscle, uh, which is assessed by passing a variable frequency, very high voltage, but very low current levels through the muscle, such that the, the, the stimulus is imperceptible and the recording is actually a passive measure of the impedance of the muscle. And on the left-hand side, um, a, a healthy mu muscle is, 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 is cartooned there. Uh, a, a sinusoidal uh, uh, stimulus is presented and the impedance of the muscle creates a, a, both a delay in the, in the recording of the muscle and a diminution of this, the, the, the voltage that is basically assessed at the recording electrodes. In disease muscle, connective tissue increases, and connective tissue is much more permissive to electrical current. And so the stimulus much more closely uh, resembles the, the, the response. And you can see the, the, the response of phase changes in healthy participants and ALS participants in this figure. The, the entire curve of how the muscle reacts to different frequencies is different. And if you just assess one frequency or a couple of frequencies, you can look at how this changes over time. And here's a study from a, 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 a 10 different sites looking at national, natural history of changes in, in ALS functional rating scale. And if you look at the right-hand graph at the top, the decline in 50 kilohertz phase in, in the fastest changing muscle in, over the course of, of about a year. And you can see that th these are some potential power analyses that suggest how many patients it would take to see a meaningful change for a variety of different uh, home measures. And you can see on the, on the bottom right, the, these, the, the, the sample size can potentially be really decreased uh, by using uh, EIM. And now this, this is a measurement that can be assessed at home. Patients are, are quite good at learning how to use this. And the device is, uh, is a handheld device. So this is potentially something that can be looked at at home and is, is being looked at, at a, in a variety of, of natural history studies, uh, but although not yet in clinical trials. We're also getting much better at looking at pulmonary function. This is just a, a picture of a, a home spirometry device that is quite inexpensive and can be just sent to a, a participant in a clinical trials home or a patient in a clinic of a clinic. Um, and um, over the last couple of years, uh, we've developed a number of training uh, 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 programs to, to actually assess this at home in a quite reliable way. This just looks at, like, at the relationship between vital capacity assessed in a standard in-clinic visit and vital capacity assessed in a televisit. Um, and you can see that, that just for a single uh, measurement, the, the correlation is actually very, very high, that the, the measurements are very similar to each other. Uh, the slope is, is essentially one, which means that the, the, they're assessing the vital capacity with very similar estimates, and the variability is actually quite good. We're using this now in, in the platform trial, and we'll be able to compare vital capacity over a very significant uh, segment of time uh, assessed in clinic and assessed at home. And we'll be able to tell how much 
uh, the information is degraded or, or, or whether we can just as easily measure vital capacity in this way going forward. I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about speech. Um, there are a number of, of different ways of, of analyzing speech. Uh, the oral analytics is, is, a, is a, a small company that has developed a very sophisticated speech app that can be installed on either an iPhone or an Android phone and assesses a, a host of different attributes of speech, uh, including motor aspects, rate of speech, artic articulatory precision, use of consonants, as well as the cognitive aspects of speech. Uh, and and our, we're in the process of now of using this as an exploratory me uh, measurement in clinical trials to see both how reproducible these kinds of measurements are, how reliable patients are at measuring these attributes at home, and, um, and to, to correlate changes in speech with changes in other things that we know occur in ALS. Um, this is, is a slide looking at patients who are more rapidly declining and patients who are more slowly declining, the individual sort of jagged lines are uh, representations of each, each, each line is, is an individual patient. And you can see how some patients over time have, have participated and, and pr provided a lot of data. And you can see that the decline is, is significant over a, a few month period. Um, and then, uh, and, and that we can distinguish between patients who are rapidly progressing with respect to speech function and those that are declining much more slowly. In terms of connecting speech attributes to different measurements that we're more familiar with, this is a correlation of a prediction of the ALS functional rating scale single question on speech which varies from zero to four, zero meaning no function, four implying normal function. Uh, the actual score is, is presented on the x-axis and the predicted value from a speech application is on the y-axis. And you can see that uh, the project, project prediction of the ALS functional rating scale score on speech um, based on uh, the, the analysis of, of speech activity is very closely correlated to the actual response that, that participants will give uh, when, when they are, are assessed in terms of this functional rating scale. So there's a good correlation between function as perceived by, by an individual ALS participant and uh, function as perceived by a, an objective speech application. We've also started to use uh, a speech measure to assess breathing. Uh, and this was at least potentially much more of, a, of an acute issue in the early days of the pandemic when we were really committed to continuing our clinical trials activity, but coming into a clinic and participating in a pulmonary function test, which involves an, a, a forceful exploration of air, was perceived of as being quite a, a potentially risky event to, to participate in. And so, we worked to try to see whether we could predict with a, a, an application as part of the speech app to, to see if we could predict vital capacity. And the, and, the, and the attribute that seemed to be the most clearly correlated was a measurement of sustained phonation, where you'd ask a, a participant to take a deep breath and just go, ah, for as long as they could. And using that, we tried to predict what the vital capacity would be. Um, this is some data of, of uh, both longitudinal participation in sustained phonation on the bottom of these, these, these uh, five cur curves and actual measurement of vital capacity on the top. And you can see that these are very frequently obtained measurements. You can see that, that the, the decline in uh, uh, phonation time and the decline in vital capacity really closely mirrored each other in these five patients. And, um, and when People were very good at, uh, at, uh, at, at performing one of the tasks, uh, vital capacity, in, in that the error bars are very narrow. The error bars are also narrow in, um, minimum, in, in phonation time. Looking at um, just the, the, the point estimate of predicted for, uh, vital capacity as measured by the, the, the spirometer and true force vital capacity and, 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 and the prediction that is is from the, the sustained phonation, you can see that the correlation is about 0.8. There's some scatter, but that we 
probably can use this in a pinch to predict vital capacity when necessary. And this may be important both clinically and in a, in a clinical trial situation. Another attribute of home measures is that they can be measured much more frequently. And this is just a cartoon to represent why this might be important. In a clinical trial situation, we have the, the situation on the left-hand side where we measure whatever we're measuring on a two to three month interval. And there's gonna be some variability in that measurement, either variability in terms of patient performance or variability in terms of the actual performance of the, of the, 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 the uh, measurement tool itself. Uh, one way that this might be really uh, uh, ameliorated is by measuring the same attribute over and over and over again, very often. In this case, the, the, the cartoon suggests every day. And you can see the cloud of, of, of data that, that uh, you might obtain in, in that situation where you're measuring the same attribute as you are on the left, but measuring them every day. And you can see that in that situation, you might expect that the error bars around the slope of decline get much more narrow, uh, implying that you could see a, a potential clinical response much more easily. And so uh, 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 Seward Rutkov and, and, and I performed a, a natural history study where we never met the participants in the study, but we consented them remotely. We sent them a number of, ana uh, of analysis tools. We trained them on, on the performance of this, and we asked them to measure their own attributes every day for three months, and then slightly less frequently thereafter for another six months. And this is just a scatter plot of some individual patients showing um, how the, the, the uh, standard error, error bars actually decrease with more frequent assessment. Um, on the left-hand side, the attributes are being measured daily. Then we downsample to twice weekly, weekly, biweekly, and monthly. And you can see that for a number of measurements, electrical impedance myography, hand grip strength, vital capacity, even the ALSFRS, the more frequently you assess the, the measurement, the narrower the error bars get. And this is yet another way that, that home measures could be used to improve the sensitivity of our measurement. I wanna change gears now and just talk a little bit about a, a, a completely different mar mar biomarker, a fluid marker of neurofilament light chain. Jeremy, um, because, yes. May I, um, may I just, I very much apologize. I just need to let some folks in. Uh, sure. May I just reclaim host for one moment and then I'll give that right back to you. Do I do so? I'll stop sharing. I'm just, I apologize. I didn't no realize that there was, uh, I'm just gonna let everyone in here. Um, okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna- That's fine. It was a good, it was a good segue. I was, I was waiting for, okay. There you go. You should be all set now. Okay. Apologies. No worries. So just in the last couple of minutes, just, just to talk about where we are on a very encouraging uh, fluid marker that Yet, you know, we, we're, we're now coming to have to ask questions about as well. Um, neurofilament light chain is, is, a, is something that can be measured in the CSF or plasma. Um, the increase in neurofilament, which occurs in ALS, is thought to reflect uh, aspects of neuronal or axonal degeneration. And it's been shown in ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases that uh, baseline levels of neurofilament uh, are, are increased in disease state. Uh, in at least some diseases, including spinal muscular atrophy and multiple sclerosis, effective therapy is associated with reduction in NFL. And uh, as many, many people know in this audience, in a, in a phase uh, one slash two study of tofersin, an antisense oligonucleotide that uh, is aimed at, at superoxide dismutase in familial ALS with SOD1 mutations, um, neurofilament declined with treatment and was associated with a, what, what seemed to be a quite potent clinical signal. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've, we've learned a couple of things that have sort of encouraged caution in our evaluation of, the, uh, of NFL and what it truly means. One, one data point is that in the Amalek study, which was positive on a variety of clinical attributes, neurofilament light chain didn't uh, decrease over the period of time of that study. And very recently, 
uh, the phase three Tofersen study was presented uh, and, and, and suggested all, that although uh, the, the drug was actually very effective at impacting several fluid markers, uh, the, the treatment actually was associated with a smaller clinical signal than might have been expected. And just to show some of the data, Up and since the, I seem to be having trouble advancing. There we go. And this is just some some data uh, about changes in, in 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 natural history. On the left hand side, you can see that neurofilament is increased in ALS patients as compared to control subjects. And, uh, and it can be effectively measured both in plasma and CSF. And on the right-hand panel is a graph showing that if you, if you divide uh, people at baseline uh, according to their, to their neurofilament levels, higher, higher baselines portend worse prognosis than lower baseline neurofilament levels. Um, and this is just a, a, a data obtained uh, that, that was reported uh, at the ANA by, by Tim Miller regarding the Tofersen study, uh, they looked at both CSF uh, SOD1 levels on the left-hand side and, and effect on neurofilament on the right-hand side. And it, the, the dash line are the treated patients, uh, I mean, the, 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 control, the control participants, and the solid lines are the, the uh, treated participants. And both with respect to SOD1 levels, and maybe even more dramatically with neurofilament, uh, the levels can be impacted by, by therapy in a quite dramatic way. Um, however, this study was also associated with, uh, although there were clinical signals that seemed to be apparent, they were fairly small. And so understanding how neurofilament predicts outcome in ALS trials is still speculative. And so um, this is just presented as a bit of a cautionary note saying that Although all of us want uh, uh, biomarkers that are easily obtained and change with, with disease progression, we still have some work to do to understand how any of these markers, even our most potentially optimistic one, neurofilament, actually predict clinical outcomes in ALS. So I'll stop there and just say that, that we have a variety of new functional outcomes that can be performed at home and may offer increased sensitivity to change in ALS. Um, that home measurement is quite feasible, um, but uh, that we have cautions in terms of, especially when we're looking at, 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 uh, at potential surrogates or, 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 or uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers, we're still not uh, at a point where we can accurately assess what they mean in terms of predicting clinical outcome. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for the great talk. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up uh, through the chat, the Zoom chat for questions. Um, if anybody wants to type some out now, that would be fantastic. While we wait, um, I guess, Jeremy, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and weigh in with, with a question of my own. Um, you talk about the, the uh, increased frequency of sampling uh, being beneficial. Um, especially with the at-home uh, data collection. Um, I wondered if in your experience, you're finding ways to encourage uh, people with ALS to continue to, to uh, give those data, uh, to provide those over time. Are there specific techniques um, or strategies that, that you've deployed? That's a great question. Um, both you know, in, in, in studies that are just trying to look at natural history or be participating in clinical trials. And the motivations, I think, are different. Um, I think this is early days. Uh, James Berry, has, has, uh, is gonna, who's going to talk next, has some experience in, in different ways to design uh, uh, these assessments in, in ways that are, 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 are easy and, and motivating. Um, many people with ALS really are committed to, to, to doing this and it takes no encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, but but for, for some of these, especially the active measures, it's an investment of time. And, and so um, there have been thoughts of, you know, sort of incorporating some of these measurements into a game-like environment. Um, I think that when these measurements are incorporated into clinical trials, uh, 
the, the therapeutic aspect of it also impacts people quite in, in, a, in a positive way, making them want to assess these, you know, to, to in, be involved in these assessments. But I, I think it's early days. We, we don't have great strategies yet. Thank you. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions that have uh, started to come in. I'll go ahead um, with the first one from Dr. Brown. Um, can you please comment on fluid biomarkers uh, for inflammation now recognized as a, as a significant part of ALS progression? Um, well, I, I guess I, I wouldn't call myself the one of the true experts of, of fluid biomarkers, but I would say that what we know about um, biomarkers of inflammation, and there are many now, are that uh, their predictive value in terms of uh, of suggesting a clinical signal are less are less well established than neurofilament, and so while many of these things are, are are very important in acting as pharmacodynamic markers and showing that target engagement has has occurred, uh, I, I would say that they're they're nowhere close to serving as potential surrogates that predict a clinical outcome. Thank you. And then I think we have time for, for one more um, uh, question. Uh, what did we learn from the use of Munix as a primary endpoint in the Rescue ALS uh, CLEAN study? Um, was it a good approach, appropriate primary endpoints? So Munix is uh, a, an electrophysiologic tool in the category of motor unit number estimation, uh, which attempts to look at the peripheral component of, of ALS, uh, and, and in particular, looking at the number of motor axons innervating a particular muscle being recorded from. Um, there are a variety of different methods. Munix is one of them. Uh, the advantage of Munix is that although it does require training uh, on the part of, of, of the evaluator, uh, the, it, there's a little bit more of an automated approach than some of the other motor unit estimate, uh, estimation tools. Uh, I think the, the, the rescue uh, ALS study, um, in, so that, that study employed Munix as a primary outcome measure. And actually, I think that was a little bit uh, uh, preliminary to do that because uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a surrogate for motor unit loss that hasn't been validated in terms of showing how it impacts progression. Uh, but uh, people were able to, to perform this tool, this, this measurement in a pretty reproducible way. It, it, uh, it, it suggested a signal that was roughly uh, uh, the same strength as a clinical signal. So I thought that it, it was actually quite encouraging. Um, I, I would, because, because of the, the time required to do it, the fact that it takes a significant uh, in-clinic experience, I would say that it's probably most appropriate for phase two studies such as this one rather than a phase three outcome. But I think physiological studies of, of this kind are, are likely to be very useful going forward. Thank you very much. And we did get a number of really great questions in addition to those, but I'm gonna move on um, and uh, pass the, the platform over to Dr. James Berry. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for having me here. I'm going to share my screen and, and get started. So this is <clears throat> in many ways going to be sort of part two of what, of, of, uh, what we just heard. Um, Fernando, can you see that? Can you see my, my slides, right? Yes. Great. So, so I'm going to talk more about biomarkers and some novel digital endpoints. Um, and, and I, I, uh, it's almost like Jeremy and I coordinated, we did to uh, sort of try to hit on some various topics um, uh, with Jeremy talking a little bit more about some of the things that are really here that are in trials that are, that are um, you know, have kind of gone through a period of exploration and there's still a lot more to be learned about them. I'm gonna touch on things that are sort of in that period of exploration a little bit more. Some of them turning the corner into trials, some of them uh, really um, still quite exploratory. And one of these, and, and this came up in the chat actually, was is about urinary P75 extracellular domain, which can be measured in the urine, but not a biofluid um, that we actually had spent a lot of time looking at, but it's a, um, because this is, uh, because of sort of the matrix of the urine, it's easier to look in the urine than either spinal fluid or blood for urinary P75 extracellular domain. 
This is a neurotrophin receptor. It's actually a very promiscuous receptor. It can be um, impacted by many of the different neurotrophins and actually can be either pro-epitotic or can be pro-survival. It's cleaved during both neurodevelopment and neurodegeneration so that it becomes an extracellular protein and the extracellular domain of P75 is then filtered into urine and can be measured there, as, I, as I've said. Um, and um, it is increased in ALS relative to controls. And it also increases over time within people with ALS. So that's, um, th that's different uh, than P75, I think, or, pardon me, than, than uh, neurofilament. I think a question came up about neurofilament uh, and sort of whether it went up over time or whether, whether it was stable. So neurofilament appears to be mostly stable. It seems to rise mostly in the pre-symptomatic period or very early symptomatic period. Um, th this is different. It, it, it seems to rise over time as a disease monitoring biomarker. And it does also, because of that, um, predict survival. So really compelling, this is data from one study. There are now a, a few studies that, um, that have shown that. Um, Mary Louise Rogers and her lab at Flinders University are really the world's experts. They've been developing this assay in ALS for many years. There is an off-the-shelf assay. They've made many tweaks to it and, and uh, are, you know, seem to have good results from this. It's important to say that treatment responsiveness has not been established. So it's, it, we have not established that if we treat ALS and if we were to be successful at that, that we would see a reduction in urinary P75, but it certainly follows from a, from a theoretical perspective. So that would be the hypothesis. And it has been used now at least in one published ALS trial, the trial of dimethylfumarate, which is Steve Vucic's group, um, and that was published just this year. There was no effect of the drug on the primary or secondary endpoints, including urinary P75. And in fact, if we look at the slope of urinary P75, the slope increased more rapidly in the treatment group. And it's uncertain to me whether that, uh, which was not exactly what we saw in the clinical endpoints, whether that is meaningful or, or just sort of the, the consequence of having a, a fairly small end. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot more to be learned and the plan is to put this into the Healy platform trial and measure it so that we can learn more in a trial setting. And I, and I will also just say that there are many, many additional biomarkers. You know, there's sort of a, a running list of biomarker ideas that, that one keeps and, and there, you know, that, that list could fill up, you know, slides and slides and slides, but just to put a few of these um, and, and attach them to a few companies that are working on them, for example, motor neuron-derived exosomes, uh, Neurodex is a company that's working on this. I think a really compelling idea that we can not only sort exosomes and, and analyze their contents, but also sort them for the exosomes that come from motor neurons, which is, which is potentially really powerful. There are, you know, we've, we've been working on proteomics for some time. There are aptamer-based proteomics. Somalogic has a platform for this. We actually shared samples from the Niels Bio Repository with them a decade ago. Their platform has gone through many improvements since then. And um, we, we see that um, you know, there may be real power in this and we're exploring that more, not just across ALS, but across neurodegeneration, which could be a really powerful um, data set to have. Inflammatory biomarkers, I think Jeremy hit on some of the problems with variability in inflammatory biomarkers. When we look at sort of plasma serum or even CSF, um, Olink has a panel that they're exploring and exploring even with some trial um, uh, samples that are that are uh, existing, um, and I think we may we may get more information there. I'm I'm hopeful, but but uh, chastened a little bit by the variability that we've seen in some of the studies that we've done. MCP1, which is a marker of inflammation in the CSF and chitinases as well, do seem to have pretty good data uh, for uh, reflecting inflammation in the CSF. When we look in the CSF, I think uh, data from the blood is, is much more mixed if we look in plasma. TDP43 is, I think, potentially really powerful, really elusive to this point, looking really in any biofluid. Um, there's some data from the Sadri Vakili lab recently um, looking at, at, at phosphotau, and there may be phosphotau isoforms that, that are informative. Again, quite early in, in sort of figuring out whether there is something there. And MIR-181 recently published um, as a potential prognostic biomarker that, in, that actually encompassed a lot of the data that we see in neurofilament, but maybe adds to that as well. And then the last thing I would say is that when we talk about inflammatory biomarkers, it's been difficult to look at them in plasma, a little more productive in CSF, although there are still some challenges there. Um, really where we'd like to look is PBMCs, and there are a number of studies looking at PBMCs in a very exploratory way, 
And the challenge in working with PBMCs, well, one of the challenges in working with PBMCs is that how those PBMCs are cryopreserved is it can really, really impact the answers that we get when we analyze them, especially when we're looking at gene expression, which can change, you know, if we were to ship things even overnight from sites to a central processing lab. There is this um, smart buffer that, that uh, essentially preserves PBMCs rather than cryopreserving them, you do sort of a, a fixative step, but it's a light fixative and they can still be flow sorted from there. So there may be some, and, and you can actually do expression analysis as well. The one thing you can't do is a functional assay where you, where you sort of activate the cells. So I think there, there may be some real power in this and we've started doing um, um, some analyses in ALS with smart buffer and there, there may actually be uh, real legs to this. So something I think to look for in the future. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change gears a little bit now and look at digital outcome, talk a little bit about digital outcome measures um, with the promise that novel digital biomarkers may give us more data at a lower burden. And I'm actually going to really focus on smartphones because smartphones present this real opportunity. Um, and again, you know, th this is thinking about more sort of on the horizon things than what, than what Jeremy is talking about, which I think are, are you know, becoming fairly well healed things that we can do at home. But smartphones are, are sort of loaded with sensors and, and you know that includes accelerometers, gyroscopes, GPS, call logs, text logs, even the screen when the screen is on and off. Those things can tell us about how people behave and behavior changes with, with health or illness. Um, we can also get active data, fine finger movement tasks, cognitive tasks, um, and speech recordings. And there are even ways, and I'll talk about this at the very end, of sort of looking at combination tasks that are almost passive data, but they're a little bit more constrained. And, and one of the other things about cell phones is that we have them with us. And so these are, you know, whether these numbers are exactly right or not, they come from some survey study, but um, you know, the fear of having no, no cell service or running out of battery has a name, it's called nomophobia. Um, and I think we can all feel in ourselves that that is a, that is a real thing. Um, and, and there are these studies that say that 90% of people have their mobile phone within arm's reach throughout the day. Uh, um, and so, you know, I think there, there is this opportunity to use a smartphone as a proxy for how we are behaving. And again, just to hit very briefly on, on the concepts that Jeremy introduced of active data collection and passive data collection with active being tasks, tests, or surveys. And in this, in this setting of sort of mobile phones, we're thinking about, you know, things that we can ask people on the phone or have them do. Compliance is really the main drawback here. And then the other thing is that whatever tasks you have them do, has to be meaningful to the disease. And then passive data collection is really, you know, sort of people live their everyday life, we quantify it through sensors and the, and the unique drawback here is noise. And also that we need to use sophisticated algorithms uh, in order to analyze data, which, you know, we have to really have a lot of trust in. So for example, this is what GPS data looks like from a number of participants until we apply algorithms. And then we can see that this is what the GPS looks like over time. And interestingly, this is actually from people with ALS, and you can see that there is a slight trend toward uh, people having um, moving around a little bit less as time goes along, compelling signal. So we're doing a study that we call the symptom monitoring for ALS in real time study or the SMART study. Um, we use something called the BWE platform, which is uh, developed at the Harvard School of Public Health by the Onella lab. Um, and it's essentially a, a platform that collects passive data and allows us to both make voice recordings and ask surveys on the, on the phone. Um, that data goes to the Amazon web server. Um, it's all HIPAA compliant. And there's actually, they're now building out an analytics platform as well so that it all can be analyzed in, in the cloud, which is the trend for, I think, all of these platforms. Um, we're doing, we're, we're sort of asking questions, ALS, FRSR, if we can, we're getting a vital capacity and we're asking something called the the CPIB, which I'll show you in a bit, it's about communication. Um, and we're doing that about every 12 weeks throughout participation. And we're doing surveys, including ALSFRSR, this CPIB that I, that I told you about, the roads that Jeremy mentioned, as well as some depression and fatigue surveys. And we're having people do various voice tasks as well, and then getting all the survey data that we've talked about. And for a small group of, smaller group of people, about 50, we're having them now um, in conjunction with uh, support from MT Pharma, um, where either the MODIS step watch, which is an ankle, sort of an ankle uh, sensor, or the actigraph watch, which goes on the wrist to help us um, learn more about how a wearable compares to a smartphone. So one of the early things that we did, and this data is actually not from our cell phone study, it's from a tablet study, but many studies have shown this, that self-entry ALSFRSR correlates well with the standard sort of delivered ALSFRSR, but it's not the same. 
it's it's um, about two points different. We've shown that in a number of studies. I think some may show it's a even a little bit less than that, um, but I think we have to be cautious about using them as interchangeable. Um, and, and we do see that they also decline. But another thing that we have noticed in our smartphone study is that we can look not only at, at the ALSFRSR score, but how long does it take people to take that survey? And the longer it takes people to take the survey, the lower the score is likely to be. So you can actually see this trend from people who have a normal score taking a shorter period of time, and then you see a slope up to people taking a longer time when they have a, um, a lower score. And that may be either covariate or even a variable in and of itself. And so we'll have to look at how this performs over time. This is cross-sectional data and again, unpublished. So Jeremy has talked about, about some speech metrics. One of the very simplest ones is just speaking rate. And we do see that that declines overall, but we, we also see that when we dichotomize people into what is a kind of a normal speaking rate above 150 words per minute and, a, and an abnormal speaking rate lower than 150 words per minute, it is much more likely uh, in this small group of, of people that we selected for the study anyway, it's, it's much more likely that those who have um, speaking, speaking rate uh, abnormal- I'm listening to it then. At, at the onset, are much more likely to show uh, changes over time. And this may, be, may be a way to um, enrich analysis in clinical trials to really focus on those who have abnormal speech rate at the beginning. Uh, but I think, again, all this is fairly early and that's, that's kind of the theme of what I'm talking about. There is something called the Communicative Participation Item Bank or the CPIB that I talked about us doing. It's a 10 item questionnaire looking at how people use communication in a deeper way. So not just is your speech normal or not, but can you communicate with people you know, with those you don't know, something complex, something conversational uh, versus sort of you know, just simple concepts. And I think we're, we're trying to use this to give some meaning to the, the motor speech metrics that we're calculating, because ultimately it's good to be able to quantify things, but we need them to have a meaning in order to make them sort of actionable or for, for regulators to, to take action on them. And so um, in this study, what we've done is looked at um, people and divided them by people who are bulbar asymptomatic, that is a speaking rate that's normal over 150 words per minute. People who have bulbar symptoms, that is a speaking rate that's less than 150 words per minute. And what we see is that almost categorically, if people are speaking rapidly, normally, they don't have a problem with communicative participation in life. And if they're speaking more slowly, they do have a, a problem with communicative participation. And I think this is the kind of thing that we can go to regulators and say, look, this is not only something quantifiable, but also meaningful in people's lives. And that's really important. We're also looking at uh, GPS. Um, and I showed a little bit of that data early on, but we happen to have some people in a study who were using um, the VWE app at the time that the COVID pandemic was declared now almost two years ago, about March 15th. Um, and we looked at how much time they were spending at home before the pandemic and after. And first I would say that the, this small group of, of um, 10 or a dozen people were spending a lot of time at home pre-pandemic, almost 20 hours a day at home. And they went up to spending essentially 24 hours a day at home. There were a few people that made a trip here and there, like really, really sort of telling. Now, interestingly, based on published data doing essentially the same thing in healthy populations, people went from spending 10 hours a day at home to 14 hours a day at home. So I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think this is a reasonable way to capture change in behavior, looking at GPS and, and sort of time spent at home. We can also look at locations visited throughout the day or distance traveled, and we've looked at all of those and they do seem to be responsive. Um, but also I think it, it quantifies what we hear from people with ALS, which is that they are at home and they sort of, you know, many people said, look, I'm, I'm, I've been used to the quarantine because that's how I've been living even prior to COVID. And I think this quantifies that and it can be powerful in that way. But as an outcome measure in, in trials, it could potentially be really important. The other thing is that just as the different domains in the ALS FRSR correlate with one another, um, we see that, that we can do a similar correlation. What I'm showing here first is, um, is actually GPS correlating with the, the, the ALS FRSR gross motor subscale. And there is this correlation, it's not perfect. I don't think we would expect it to be perfect, um, but, uh, but I think it gives some credence to the idea that, that we're measuring something important. And actually, I think I took out the, ne the next slide, but I, the, the home time as measured by GPS also correlates with some of the motor speech analysis that we do in, in terms of, of speaking rate. In the same way that the, the bulbar subsection of the ALS-FRSR correlates with gross motor in a broad way. 
Um, this is data just looking at compliance. I have to say, I was a little bit skeptical about compliance for a wearable going into this study. What we found is that we do see a group of people who have trouble with compliance. Some of those actually go on to be good compliers later on in the study, but some are sort of, you know, they have, a tr they have trouble complying in the beginning. They have trouble complying throughout. This is something we see with all of these digital measures. Actually, there is this group that's, that's sort of more challenging. Um, but actually, the compliance has been quite good throughout most of the study, and, and I've been encouraged by that. Variability may be overcome by quantity when we think about wearables. So this is just steps per day look coming off of this wearable. And we can see that um, it, this is one participant. Um, we see a decline in their steps per day. And then there's something called peak performance index, which has to do with how quickly people are, are walking as well as how much of the day. And we do see this downward trend, but we also see a lot of variability. What remains to be seen is how does that variability play out? Um, and and you know, how does this look when we when we look broadly across the study um, and so you know excited to find that out and the last thing i'll talk about is a study we're doing with a company called nq which has a a keyboard um, which is goes it's a virtual keyboard that goes onto the um the phone it's available for for both android and ios when we start out the study we have them do alternate finger tapping which has been used in parkinson's a lot simple tasks to just tap one tap the other and go back and forth um, and then we have them do, uh, that's sort of for a baseline task. We also have them do something we call a paragraph copy, which is using this NQ keyboard, copy a paragraph um, exactly so that we know exactly what they're doing. And what the keyboard does is log the way that they type. That is the press time on each key, the flight time between keys, the number of backspaces. It does not capture what, they, what they're typing, but only how they're typing it. But with a, with a paragraph copy, we know sort of what they were typing. And then they go on to use this NQ keyboard just like they would use any keyboard. Um, and it, it does that same thing of logging how they type. And we get a, a tremendous amount of data about sort of how people are using their fine finger movements throughout the day. Now, this has been done in Parkinson's and the NQ index can actually do a fairly good job of separating out people who have Parkinson's from controls. And you can see that in the receiver operator curve here. What I'm not showing, but, but they've also shown is that they can differentiate on and off states um, with uh, treatment with cinema. So I think what we wanna know now is can it distinguish um, change over time in a population of people with ALS and we're partway through that study and I find it to be quite, quite interesting. So huge amount of work from many, many partners in all of the studies that we show. And um, again, this is, you know, some of this is sort of further afield than what Jeremy talked about, but exciting, I think. Thank you, James. That was fantastic. Well, massive. You have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, really excited to see how that uh, all plays out. Um, I have one question first while we wait for uh, some more to come in through the chat. And it goes back to the very beginning of your talk, the P75, uh, urinary P75. Um, do you know if the assay somehow normalizes for hydration level? Um, does that really matter uh, in, in that endpoint? Yeah, so it does normalize for the urine creatinine, uh, and and that's sort of a yeah, that's a part of, of that assay, and I think a part of what what made it go from being kind of an interesting observation to a useful assay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, I, I'd wondered about that. Um, we have a question about um, uh, cytokine biomarkers and plasma and and CSF. Is that something that that uh, you're exploring, or do you know of other groups that are? Yeah, so we did a study. Um, you know, I worked with. Uh, Bowser and, and we worked with some of the folks at Denali and we looked at, at um, longitudinal samples, both CSF and plasma um, from about 100 people, 150 people, I think, and then some of those had longitudinal. Um, and many centers have been involved in, in, in uh, collecting those samples. What we found is that there were a few of the, of the, of the biomarkers, the inflammatory biomarkers and cytokines that, that were relatively reliable, IL-18, MCP1 and CSF, but by and large, we saw a lot of variability and not as much signal as we had hoped. Um, and that, you know, again, I, I'm, that's, that's played out in other studies that we've seen as well. And so I think um, we need to, you know, we need to really think about what are the best biomarkers. Chitinases look, look good as well. Um, uh, and actually Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics looked at that in their phase two trial. Um, and there've been a few observational studies that looked at that as well. And Bob Bowser's done a lot of work there. Thank you. Um, another question um, with regard to, to the time at home and those, those interesting data, is it um, uh, adjusted for seasonality? 
So we haven't yet done that. What, one of the things that was nice about sort of starting with that analysis that we did is that it was really looking at one season because it was all, it was all looking at that time of, of sort of COVID onset. When we do, need, when we do look at sort of um, you know, ALS and how does that change over time, we will have to adjust for season. So there are, there are a few things. Actually, there's a periodicity to our weeks that, that we need to take into account. And then there is also a periodicity to seasons that we need to take into account. That gets even more complex when you think about geography because there's more periodicity in certain locations where it gets colder and less in other locations. So that's, that's why we sort of decided to take a look and say, can we, in a, in a sort of proof of concept way, can we see what should be a major signal um, with COVID? And then let's look back and look at, um, you know, sort of ALS and, and sort of see, um, you know, what we see in a more complex way. Thank you very much. Um, really, really fascinating uh, presentation by both you and Jeremy. Um, we'll close there um, on the, the joint presentation of new disease progression biomarkers. Uh,